Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the second of our online seminars for our online course about the referendum. Today's seminar concentrates on the case for yes and I'm delighted to say that today we are joined by Marco Biaggi who is the MSP for Edinburgh Central and is a member of the Scottish National Party and in addition to him we have our usual panel of me, Alan Convery, Professor Charlie Jeffrey and Professor Nicola McEwen. As ever we're really interested in your interaction with the debate and today Charlotte is, is on hand to feed to us some, some of your interesting, interesting tweets, tweets and comments and we hope that you'll be able to keep them uh, respectful and constructive as we continue with our analysis of the referendum debate today. We're concentrating on three main themes today, the general mechanics of independence, um, things to do with money and the economy and the NHS and wider issues of public policy. But we begin today looking at the mechanics of independence and we have a question from Emma Neve Wilson um, on Twitter who asked, is, the independence, is independence binary or is it a spectrum? If it's a spectrum, how are voters meant to express that on the ballot? And this, I think, Nicola links into some of the discussion we've been having about the difference between Devo Max and independence. It, it does. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think, it, I think it's a brilliant question. I think independence is a spectrum. Um, and in that way, having a referendum with only two choices forces um, a sometimes polarised debate between two options and doesn't really capture the fluidity sometimes between them. Um, so it, it's a bit of a blunt tool. On the other hand, it is a democracy and it's the only one that we have to legitimise the process. Of course, there could have been an, a second question that could have captured something else, and perhaps Mark might want to come back on that. Um, but it is a little bit um, at odds with the way that the Scottish National Party has developed uh, recently, where it has tried to um, progress self-government, the cause of self-government, in a very gradual way, and having a referendum almost reverts back to a kind of all our not exactly all or nothing, but it's it's forcing a choice. Mm. Um, so it's a little bit different from the step-by-step -step, um, process that has uh, been the dominant process in the SNP recently. Well, that said, there were discussions, there were attempts to put uh, another option on the ballot paper, a Devo Max option, whereby Scotland governs itself in all areas of home affairs, but... Uh, you know, remains with the UK government for, for foreign and uh, defence, but it was indeed the UK government that didn't want that sure. on the ballot paper and, and opposed that. I think it, it's easy to say that independence is a spectrum, and it, it certainly is, and it runs far beyond what is being proposed here. After all, there's, there are no countries uh, in the world that are entirely independent of outside forces that can do whatever they want with no consequences. Even the United States is, is in that way not entirely independent. But there is, maybe to borrow a term from from debates elsewhere, there is the question of sovereignty. There is where is the final legal power over Scotland? Is that a final legal power, the final, the say in the final analysis, if there is such a thing? Uh, is it at Westminster and therefore the UK is sovereign and the sovereign entity, or is it here in Scotland and making Scotland the sovereign entity with the independent memberships of everything? So in that, yes, there is a binary, there is a binary choice, but, you know, We've been open when the Scotland Act was put through Westminster in 2009-10, that period we suggested six extra powers that could be devolved at that point, uh, including welfare, broadcasting, and there wasn't an appetite. So we're in a situation now where, yes, we have this, this binary choice, but it's, uh, it's an important one and a lot flows from that. Charlie? There's a, there's a different kind of spectrum around independence at play in this debate uh, as well. Uh, and that is the different interpretations of independence that are being put forward by the no side, in particular the UK government, and the yes side, in particular the, the Scottish government. Now, the Scottish government is, is presenting independence in some respects as being interdependent and, and finding new forms of partnership with uh, the rest of the UK should Scotland uh, vote yes. The UK government is presenting a, a different vision of independence, which is perhaps harder edged, uh, uh, which uh, says that to be independent you have to have your own currency, you have to control your own borders, you have to have the capacity to project uh, military uh, power. 
Uh, and the accusation, uh, and I think, I can't remember who said it, but it was said, I think, yesterday again, is that what you're offering isn't real independence. And I've heard this so many times, and I find it really ironic that the people that are opposing any independence are the ones that are trying to lecture the yes side on what independence actually is. When you look around Europe in particular, you, you see countries that are sharing currencies, for example, but nobody would say France isn't independent, Germany isn't independent. These are countries that have chosen by their own free will to share currencies, to enter into arrangements, but they remain sovereign countries themselves. At one point, many years ago, I think that definition of independence would hold. But that's a 19th century approach to what makes an independent country. And uh, I think perhaps there's a perspective, sometimes amongst people generally in the UK, where we're conditioned to believing, possibly because we've lived on an island, you know, that borders mean walls, where if you're travelling around Europe, if you cross an international border, you half the time the only thing you notice is a slight change in the colour of the, the uh, road signs. There's even a cafe on the Belgian-Netherlands border that has some tables on one side and some on the other. But the two different sets of laws for the two different nations pertain in those different sides and different areas. And that's the essence of independence, having the ability to do things differently. But yes, also being free to continue with what broadly works. No one wants to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They just want to renegotiate the terms of this partnership, which is what it was supposed to be 300 years ago, a partnership. Can I just ask, though, um, even thinking of a small state in the European Union, like Denmark, say, as an obvious comparator to how an independent Scotland might be, um, the kind of independence that's proposed, the renewal of partnership that's proposed mm. within the White Paper, does go some what more towards interdependence than, say, it's, is the case in, in Denmark or Sweden or Norway or Ireland. Um, not just in terms of currency, but lots of things are proposed to be shared, um, shared institutions, shared bureaucracies, um, shared sh joint ventures in broadcasting, mm -hmm. you know, the, these sorts of things. There's, there's very many mm -hmm. shared arrangements that are envisaged. So would it be fair to say that what's being proposed is, is almost like an, a, a new form of statehood that is statehood with mm -hmm. ties, with partnership, that is goes beyond what even a small state like Denmark in the European Union would have? I think it would be a, a unique arrangement just as in, uh, you know, if you look at any country around the world, there's something about it that's unique in its relations with neighbours, its own history. And we have these ties that we can continue to have. And that's that's a value But where we've got different interests, we become free to do it. So we can walk away from partnerships if they're not in the interest of both sides. But, you know, there's a precedent for most of the things uh, that, that you're mentioning there, currency union for example, existed between Luxembourg and Belgium for 80 years. And when you, when you look through it, I, I see things like, uh, in the white paper, things like the welfare uh, bureaucracy sharing, which is really a transition. You know, the, the understanding that we've got a, a welfare bureaucracy here in Scotland, but that will gradually diverge the, the management of the welfare state. But, but crucially, from the very start, we have the right to change those rules and change the... the the condition, the laws affecting the welfare state. So, you know, I think we'll be we'll be close certainly, but uh, I don't think that compromises independence. I think it just shows the the strength of the situation. And in that context, Marco, about mm -hmm. a spectrum of different forms of self government, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the main difference between devil max and independence? Well, it's got to be the foreign and defence. I mean, that is by definition the difference. So. You know, you get the situation under Devo Max where if there was another, another Iraq war or another war where Scotland was quite strongly opposed or any kind of military intervention where Scotland was strongly opposed and had developed an even stronger sense of autonomy, it still wouldn't be able to say, not in our name. Similarly, we would be tied into defence decisions that we weren't in charge of with quite substantial spending commitments. You know, right now Scotland sends about £3.3 .3 billion pounds to the UK government each year for defence spending. About two billion is actually spent in Scotland. But most crucially, we house the weapons of mass destruction of the UK, the entire arsenal, which Scottish public opinion is against, and which I think, well, given it's going to be 80 to 100 billion pounds on the next generation of them, I can think of just about anything else would be better to, to spend that money on, especially in a country where you've got people suffering, disabled people suffering from welfare cuts and having to end up in food banks, 
anything would be a better use of that money and we remain locked into that even under Devo Max. Mm. Do you have any more comments or should we take some comments from Twitter? Charlotte, do we have any comments so far? Not really, not at the moment, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> so encourage people to... So yeah. we still very much encourage uh, your comments on Twitter. Charlie? Well, I, I was going to, to point to one of the other questions that we've got from, from Bill Dodds, mm. uh, which is, after independence, what obligations would Scotland have to the UK uh, and vice versa? Um, because the, the defence area um, um, illustrates the, the point of the question, I think. Um, defence is one of the areas, Trident accepted, mm -hmm. Uh, where the Scottish Government and, and the Yes campaign uh, envisage cooperation with the remaining UK, uh, both, I think, bilaterally and in the context of, uh, of NATO uh, membership. Uh, and there is a question there about the expectation that the UK Government would want to have that cooperation, which is one of the big challenges, I think, in making the case on the Yes side, because we cannot know what the view of the UK government would be in the event of a yes vote. Uh, and in fact, in some areas, most notably currency union, but heading that way in, in, in other matters, there's been a suggestion that no, we wouldn't want as the UK government to collaborate in partnership in the way mm -hmm. that you're proposing. So how can, we, how can we peer ahead to the 19th and, and think about mm -hmm. what, what would sense of obligation would there be? Would there be any on the part of the UK? Well, there's the UK national interest, which is very strong after a Scottish yes vote. You know, even in defence, you see extensive collaborations between the UK and other countries around the world. They've just announced a three and a half billion pound deal for Scout armoured vehicles, but that's being built by an American company's factory in Wales. Even the independent nuclear deterrent shares a bank of missiles with uh, the the United States military. You can't really look at uh, anything in the the. British Armed Forces without seeing something that is shared, the Eurofighter is a four-nation collaborative, uh, missiles and the frigates are being built, uh, multi-deals with other European countries, that kind of collaboration already exists and it's going to be in the interest of everybody to have a managed transition on that. The currency question is an interesting one that has taken a lot of mm -hmm. airtime in the debate and it's, it's, it's one of those areas where people on the no side try to, to scare by creating this impression that, you know, everything that happens now, everything that's being said now is actually what they're going to want to do the day after independence. The day after a yes vote, there'll be a settling down to negotiations. And I, I can imagine the, the Team Scotland negotiating team going in and uh, David Cameron sitting there and, you know, is independent nuclear deterrent is now in a, another country and that's worrying. He's got £150 billion pounds extra of debt on the, the national debt that he can't make Scotland take any more of than, than we want to. He faces £500 million pound transaction costs if he doesn't agree to a currency union. You know, I've said it flippantly in the past, but at that stage, if we ask for Gibraltar, we'll get it. The fact is that the overwhelming interest for both sides is to continue that, those mechanisms. Well, I don't disagree with much of that. Um, I, I do think that the, it would be a mistake to think of the national interest as something that we can calculate in a rational, common sense mm -hmm. way. I'm not sure there's any such thing as the national interest. There's competing interests that fight for attention. So um, the Prime Minister would go into that room and he would have the pressures from the markets, the mm -hmm. pressure from the business community, the pressure from public opinion, mm -hmm pressure from political rivals and all of those things would be um, factoring into the political calculations, the strategic calculations that might be t taking place in the room. So, um, so that, that's the one thing that makes some of the positioning a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. to predict, I think. Um, the other issue uh, with respect to the cooperation, the, the extent of cooperation, I think you're right, mm -hmm. that cooperation is normal mm -hmm. between uh, independent countries. Um, but um, there is a tradition, perhaps a myth, within UK parliamentary democracy, and that's about Parliament being sovereign, mm. Westminster Parliament being sovereign. It's partly what's at the root of the UK's difficult relationship with the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I find it difficult to see why there would be a willingness to compromise the degree of sovereignty uh, that Parliament, Westminster Parliament, or the UK government by extension has, if it was to share... Uh, arrangements with Scotland that gave 
an independent Scottish government more power mm -hmm. over what happens in the rest of the UK as well. And that's where I see some of the difficulties with the sharing. But I mean, what, what institutions are you talking about there? Because when you look at currency, you've got 57 years of unilateral agreement with Ireland where, where, where they operated the sterling and the sterling zone that operated until the late 70s across most of the Commonwealth, I, I, meaning in other that, institutions. That, that currency would be one, mm -hmm. perhaps the, the idea of an energy partnership mm -hmm. would be another. I don't see these things as necessarily being mm -hmm. difficult. What I see as being difficult is arrangements that would give significant power and control mm -hmm. to an independent Scottish government. So I could see the mm -hmm. arrangement being in place, but with a degree of control over what uh, autonomy could be exercised within Scotland. Again, I'm not really sure which institutions you're talking about. Let's I mean, say an energy partnership, well, yeah, for example. When it, come, when it comes to energy, the current Energy Act set up the legislative provisions for Ireland and, French, uh, and France to put mm -hmm. energy into mm -hmm. the national grid. Mm -hmm. It's not a million miles away from that. And you've seen uh, Professor David Toke, an advisor to the European Greens, who's pointed out that at the kind of prices that the UK is uh, offering to nuclear energy providers in, in England, that Scottish renewable energy is going to be able to undercut that and compete on a market basis mm -hmm. anyway. So, you know, that's one of those areas where common interest is there. Without Scotland's renewable energy, the rest of the UK isn't going to meet its legal targets, the EU. So, again, I, I see that as a mutually advantageous deal and not one that's going to compromise either side sovereignty is simply something where we're going to be able to trade on our own terms and, and do it very well from a Scottish perspective. Yeah, that does, mm. If I can head to the third question on the list we have at, at this point, which is from HM on Twitter from a few hours ago, um, asking about how negotiations would proceed in the event of a yes vote, given that there's a general election in the UK in May 2015, uh, which strikes me as, a, as a, an extraordinarily good question because the negotiating team could well change. Uh, how big a challenge would that be, that uncertainty? Uh, and perhaps some uh, parties going into the next UK election could go into that election mm -hmm. with, uh, with manifestos saying, look, we want to be tough in this negotiation with Scotland. How do we manage that if there's a yes vote? Well, the negotiations would start relatively quickly. And I would, I mean, if you look at the, the Czech and Slovak example, if you take the time it took them to negotiate their independence, then it would actually be over by the, the Westminster election. But uh, that's one of these uh, issues, really, for the other side. I think they're going to end up having a cross-party negotiation anyway because they're going to be aware of that. A lot of the negotiation is going to take place by civil servants because that's simply how two governments will relate to each other at the level of officials. I think it's... Well, I very much hope that the UK government reflects the Scottish example, which is that we will have a breadth of opinion on the negotiating team. We can't just have the government of the day in Holyrood monopolising that because we've got to represent all the interests and all the approaches from within and without politics. So I think the, the Westminster election may even concentrate the minds and we may well find much of the negotiation already done by that point. I think we need to move on to the next area. We've already touched a little bit on currency, so we'll come on to talk about that a little bit more. But Charlotte, do we have any, any questions, questions on Twitter that might um, be interesting? Just on some of those similar themes, so Pat Oddie was talking about, um, was raising the issue about how close the, the vote is and whether it's a very close yes vote, whether that will impact on negotiations. Um, and then Anto Perini has also um, raised the issue of transition costs and how they'd be managed and how they'd be um, split between the two governments and things like that. So there's a lot of sort of ideas to get them chatting on the discussion forums as well. Good. Thanks, Thanks very much, Charlotte. So we, we move to move on to our second uh, theme for today, which is on money and the currency and general economic issues. Um, our first question on, on that uh, topic is from Maureen Banbury, who asks, who asks, how can a country be independent if it is using a currency regulated by a bank over which it has no control, i.e. the SNP wish for a currency <laughs> union in the event of a, a yes vote. Marco. Well, the independent Scotland would bring a lot to the deal and I think we'd be able to get a, a representation on there. I think that's a representation that the distinct Scottish economic interest doesn't have at the moment. You know, We depend purely for our representation in Westminster institutions on 50 
nine MPs who at present, and indeed for most of the last 55 years, have predominantly been from the party not in government, so their influence has been very much limited. Countries enter into currency deals all around the world, and it's the it's taken because it's to the advantage of those countries. The, the independent Scotland would make that cost-benefit analysis. They've had this done already, had it done by Fiscal Commission, two Nobel Prize winning economists on there, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and James Murleys, and they've all come to this conclusion that this is in the best interest for not just Scotland, but the, the rest of the UK. And we have that voice, and you get even with the agreements over monetary policy, you know, things like interest rates, you get all the controls over fiscal policy. So right now, the Scottish Parliament's responsible for how we divide up our chunk of money, but not how we raise it or how big it is. And that has really big uh, implications for health service, public services uh, in general. But yeah, it's a, it's a massive step forward in the level of autonomy that we have. And again, it, it, there's an echo here of the the approach that people who are sceptical of independence seem to be somehow trying to argue we shouldn't vote for independence because it's not independent enough. And I, I just don't understand the logic of that. Mm. How, how independent is independence, though? Um, there was a question which flashed up when we were talking about Trident on, on the Twitter feed about how much a Scottish government might sacrifice uh, in the event of a yes vote in order to achieve some of its real headline aims. And that's a question you can apply to the currency union question. Um, we've heard Mark Carney talk uh, about currency union, about the challenges of, of managing a currency union between the rest of the UK uh, and Scotland, and pointing to the need to have some agreement over the, the fiscal autonomy of an independent Scotland. How much fiscal auto autonomy would the yes side be prepared to sacrifice in order to have currency union? Well, I think you'd understand if I don't want to prejudge negotiations. There's the, the the question of being careful not to tip your hand before you go into any kind of deal making like that. But you know, across Europe, you've got countries that have agreements on deficits in order to ensure stability within the the eurozone. That might be something that would go on the table. And you know, if if an independent government or indeed a, a UK government was under an agreement not to let its deficits get too high. That's probably no bad thing for either side, to be honest, especially given the, the record in that. I, think, I was just wondering how you would respond to the intervention that is appearing in papers today, I think, from the former commissioner um, saying that for Scotland to be able to be part of economic monetary union within the European Union, there would need to be a central bank. So it's mm -hmm. essentially a... a a critique mm -hmm. of a sterilisation mm -hmm. option. How do you respond to that? Well, it's been it's been a very odd uh, line of argument from from a while in the No campaign that somehow if you vote yes, you're going to end up in the euro. When we've been saying, well, because we wouldn't be operating an independent currency for two years, we wouldn't be uh, fitting in with all the the mechanisms, we wouldn't be eligible for that. So there's no way for us to be forced to to take the euro. And I don't think. Being involved in the monetary union side of the EU is something that any party really in Scotland wants after independence. Certainly the UK doesn't want it at the moment and any of the parties represented in Westminster. I don't see the issue for the EU because the EU has you know, Denmark, Sweden, the UK countries that are not participating in the monetary union and are still welcomed important parts of, of the union itself. And we've got, you know, I can trade quotes back and forth at you. I think, uh, I think if I had my my little note sheet for uh, what happens to Scotland's EU membership uh, after a yes vote, I think a quote from you would be quite high up in it, um, arguing that it will be smooth. And uh, I think that that is going to be the case. Can I? I, mean, I can. I don't think an independent Scotland would be forced to join you mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I don't think there's any precedent for that. Um, but there might be. Um, uh, a view in Brussels that they might want some long-term commitment mm -hmm. to economic monetary union as part of a demonstration of a commitment to European integration. Mm -hmm. um, something akin to what Sweden managed to negotiate. So it's a symbolic thing, mm -hmm. but you effectively have a, an opt-out for as long as you want it. Can you see something like that being part of negotiations with the European Union, accepting that mm -hmm. you don't want to tip mm -hmm. your hat there either? Yeah. I 
would struggle to see that being accepted by a, a Scottish government and certainly by a Scottish electorate. You know, the, the euro is not something that is viewed with great uh, warmth, in, whether that's here or indeed increasingly in Germany at the heart of it for different reasons. And so I think some commitment to the value of European integration, of the European community, of countries working together, of free movement of people, all of that is something that definitely we'd be happy to entertain. I think we'd be more happy to entertain that than the current UK government and that may well affect how, how good a hearing we get when we go there. But uh, I don't think a long-term commitment, no matter how long-term and without mm -hmm. sanction it was, would be something that people in Scotland would be ready to sign up to. Okay. Just on currency union, and again prompted by something on the Twitter feed a few minutes ago, uh, which was um, essentially asking the question about whether the UK government might be bluffing uh, on, on its insistence that there will not be a currency union. Um, but having, having had that set of coordinated statements uh, back in February from George Osborne, uh, Danny Alexander and Ed Balls, and having had the Labour Party certainly go beyond that uh, in, in clarifying its attitude uh, in a post-referendum uh, post UK uh, election that currency union would be, uh, would be off the agenda. Um, is there any flexibility left on the UK side once that level uh, and publicity of commitment has been given. Well, there's always flexibility in politics, and you know when this was first uh, taken as a position, when George Osborne came and gave his sermon on the pound, the other side didn't believe they were even capable of losing. You know we've had these comments that I think were in the Herald, where senior figures on the no side were finally accepting, oh, might not actually win. You know, they've been taking this for granted since the start. There were all kinds of rumours coming out from number 10 reported in the press that they were expecting it to be 60-40 against uh, at the very least and that you know, they thought this was all going to be done and dusted by February and there was going to be no chance of actually having a debate at this stage. So you have to view the comments that they made in the context that they, they were in and you also have to remember what was said by an, a still unnamed UK minister close to a negotiating team that you know, if there was to be a yes vote, which he clearly considered to be a remote possibility, then of course there would be a currency union. That was reported in the Guardian, so or the Observer. So you know they're saying these things now as a campaigning tactic, and I think the day after, then the national interest, the mutual interest, will will kick in. It would be in everybody's interest to make independence work, and that's what the Edinburgh Agreement, which was signed between the First Minister of Scotland and the Prime Minister of the UK, commits both sides to do. We're certainly going to live up to our side of the bargain. Thanks, Marco. Before we move on to our final uh, topic for today, which concentrates on public policy issues, Charlotte, has there been anything interesting? Um, it seems like the issues of negotiations is what's... Uh interesting to it most at the moment, um, issues of whether there might be a public opinion backlash in the UK and whether that will influence the UK government's negotiating position um, and whether and who's going to be stronger in those negotiations, whether it will be the Scottish government or the UK government. Um, on the uh, point of currency though, um, a point of clarification, um, Jane Cotton has asked how much control the Bank of England has over UK fin finances or whether the government is involved in the Bank of England, so it might be useful for people to know how that works. Do, do you want to briefly comment on, <laughs> on that, Charlie? <laughs> well, can, I, can I make two quick comments? Okay. Um, uh, the, the first one may be a prompt to, to, to Marco and that's the idea of a, of a backlash. Uh, with colleagues at, uh, at Cardiff University, I and, and others here at Edinburgh University have done some research on public attitudes in England, which suggest that in the event either of a yes or a no vote, uh, that people in England favour quite, quite tough terms of negotiation uh, with Scotland, whether on the terms of independence or on the terms of further reaching uh, devolution. My question to you on that would be, um, have... have the yes side nurtured relationships uh, across the UK well uh, enough. Uh, and on that second point about uh, about Bank of England, uh, the Bank of England is is independent by statute, um, but it does report to the UK government. It has certain objectives which are set by the UK government, and could be made unindependent by a simple uh, UK parliamentary law. 
Now, I think in, in comparative terms it has a high level of independence, but that's always qualified by the nature of the political system we have in the UK, which can uh, tear up the rules and change them uh, at uh, more or less a moment's notice. Yes, and that's not particularly a system I would generally defend for approaches. I think it's much better to have government that's bounded within a constitution, and that's something that we would be trying to do. With regard to relations in the, the rest of the UK, I think there are myths in the rest of the UK about what Scottish independence is for, what Scottish nationalism, to use a, a word that maybe a lot of supporters of independence wouldn't want to apply to themselves, is about. You know, and indeed it actually happens around Europe. You get a lot of observers who will project their own experiences onto the Scottish situation. So they might be more used to linguistic nationalisms or ethnic nationalisms and exclusionary nationalisms. Nationalism, independence, the national movement, whatever you want to call it, in Scotland is more about welcoming anybody who's here. In fact, with regard to relations to Europe, as I said, we are the more open, more supportive, more cosmopolitan and internationalist side in this debate. And I think getting over those myths is a, an important part of, of future relations. But, you know, we look at uh, the, the friendly relations that, that exist now with Ireland, the, the friendly, let, let's face it, the, the UK and the US are now culturally so connected that there's a, a great interchange there. And we keep our politics separate, fortunately, at least as, as much as we can out with the, the Bush Blair years. But... You know, this kind of relationship across borders, perfectly normal, something people understand now. And yes, voters in the rest of the UK are going to want what's best for voters in the rest of the UK. That's perfectly normal. But I think, I think that the yes side thinks that what's best for voters in the rest of the UK in all of these areas is going to be what's also best for, for voters in Scotland because we want to continue to work where there is mutual interest and where we do want to do things differently. Well, that's where we'll do things differently. Thanks. So moving on to our final section, which concentrates on public policy, um, we have a question from Jonathan Silverton, um, who asked something with relation to the NHS. So he asks, how does the privatisation of NHS delivery in England affect the resources available for the NHS in Scotland? Well, any privatisation down south, whether that's the NHS or elsewhere, reduces Scotland's budget proportionate to how much is reduced in public spending south of the border. So the NHS is an example of what may happen. A good example might be what happened with tuition fees in universities, because we're in a university, it's a perfect example to give. Previously, students in England had been funded through public money. It had gone uh, as a funded place, the student took it up, money went from the public purse. That switched to tuition fees for the most part, about £9,000. As a result, you can track on the amount that was cut from the Scottish Government's budget as a result because we get a share of money to spend that's based on how much is spent directly by the UK Government, not based on charges, fees or whatever. So if the NHS goes down a similar approach, whereby more and more is charged for, whether that's GP visits, elective surgery and so on, or even if it went all the way to the kind of insurance models that some people have talked about, you know, even David Laws, a Lib Dem, floated about 10 years ago an idea of moving the NHS in England to a, an insurance model, that would result in a drastic cut. But right now, if the UK government cuts £10 in public spending from anything, Scotland's budget gets cut by £1, even if we wanted to do something different. But is it not also the case, Marco, that we might be getting confused between two, two different issues here? So there's the issue of funding and there's the issue of privatisation. So if we look at the English NHS, um, although some NHS services might be delivered by private companies, they remain free at the point of use. And throughout the time that those reforms were going on in the Labour government, we saw the most substantial, one of the most substantial increases in the NHS's funding in its history. So there's not, there's not really any question of the NHS not being, uh, the Scottish government not being able to protect the NHS in that sense. Well, the Scottish Government, because it has control over the management and the structures of the NHS, can always choose to keep it public under the powers we have at the moment. The question is, how much do you have to gut other services to fund that if funding is falling for public services in England, in particular the NHS? And you go back to that example of, of the privatisations that came in of the, the management under the Labour 
uh, government. It's interesting that that only came in because of Scottish Labour MPs who didn't have to go back to their constituents and explain that it was happening and, and try and defend it here in Scotland, which is another example of how the, occasionally some of the zealous changes to public services south of the border have happened because of you know, not very well designed constitutional structures that give Scottish MPs a, a say in England but not actually any accountability with their public. Mm. There's a lot of ifs in what mm. you were saying there, so if this happens and then it would have a cut and I yeah. appreciate that and that's the way the mechanism works but would you accept that for now um, although there is an increasing role for the private sector in, de in the delivery of health services south of the border um, that hasn't at the moment been um, coincided with a cut in public investment into the health service. So as long as the, the, the amount from the public purse is not cutting, then there is no knock-on cut for the fiscal transfer to the Scottish Government. The total public spending, well, the, the total money that's come to Scotland has gone that's down in, by 7.2%. Yes, but it's not from the NHS budget south of the border. Not thus far, no, but it is still down 7.2%. Yes. And you see the direction of travel here. You see already the, the changes that the Royal Mail has gone, has been privatised. You know, I, I don't think anybody would really argue that the long-term direction of successive UK governments has been for privatisation in a whole range of areas, and even we've seen it in the, the management of the NHS. Yes, delivery seems to be the line in the sand, but it's being washed away and there's only a matter of time. You know, we've seen experts come forward. We've seen Alison Pollock, who's an expert in the system, pointing out exactly the, the kind of analysis that I'm, I'm putting forward, saying that if you know we continue like this for 20, 30 years, we won't have uh, an NHS. And I think one of the interesting things is people don't really realise already how much different we've made the NHS in Scotland, because all of that private involvement has happened down south, and I think person it's only a matter of time before the, the final the final step is taken but up here we've done things differently we've done that because we've had the Scottish Parliament yes the NHS in Scotland's always been administratively distinct but because we had that different opinion yes under a Labour government as well in the Scottish Parliament a different approach was taken the reason we still have a fully public NHS in Scotland is because of the Scottish Parliament but the only way to protect that is to have an independent Scottish Parliament that can also guard the finances of the NHS Charlie, did you want to say something on that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to leave that one to Marco and Nicola. OK, well, um, we might move on just to a final question then, um, moving on slightly from the NHS. Um, so this question is from Andrew Feeney-Seal, who asks, um, Marco, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on the size of the Scottish Parliament. Um, already MSPs have to juggle a number of committee responsibilities and independence will increase the number of policy areas covered by the legislature. Would you personally be in favour of increasing the number of MSPs to spread this increased workload or a more radical alternative such as decentralisation within Scotland? I quite like the idea of decentralisation. I also think we should revisit the electoral system for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, the SNP has long supported single transferable vote and that can have an effect on relations between MSPs balancing things as well. You don't have the, the difference between the list MSP and the constituency MSP. Everybody is sharing constituency responsibilities. But ultimately this is something that will be decided by a constitutional convention. The way the white paper sets out, the way it seems to be endorsed by all the yes parties is that if we have a Yes, vote. We'll have an interim constitution setting out that basically the parliament continues as is. But in the first term after 2016, after people have chosen who they want as the first government of an independent Scotland, whoever that might be, might not be the SNP, we'll have a constitutional convention with ordinary citizens involved to decide the constitution. And that includes, of course, the parliament that will represent them. So my hope is that we'll have a single transferable vote parliament at that point. What size it will be, I think we'll, I will not prejudge, but uh, that is something that we'll be able to, to write from, from a blank slate. It's uh, interest. It's, I was about to say it's an exciting opportunity. Perhaps it's an exciting opportunity for political scientists <laughs> and everybody else is just going to try and find a way that works. But it is an opportunity to, to restart the Parliament's structures from, from a blank slate. 
Okay, do you have to comment on that, Charlie, or we can get some other questions? Um, I, I wanted to say one thing, and, and that is uh, that the, the white paper and the draft constitutional bill that the Scottish Government has produced are pretty silent on political structures. Uh, and that's quite uh, striking, given that there's, uh, on, in, in terms of the academic community of political scientists like us, there's quite some scepticism that the Scottish Parliament at present, with its present uh, workload, is well enough equipped in terms of, uh, of numbers of representatives or capacities more generally in the Parliament to do what it needs. And if that's the case, then it would certainly need significant additional capacities after um, independence, not least uh, because um, there would be the absence of what most other democracies have, I presume, and that's the second chamber. So how, how would we approach that question of balancing out uh, the power of Scottish institutions in an independent Scotland? Because the current situation doesn't look that promising. Well, for a country that's Scotland's size, it's actually unusual to have a, a second chamber. I think Ireland stands out as a, a counter-example, but when you look at uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, these sorts of countries, a second chamber is unusual. You do have strong local democracy and you have a decentralisation of power and that very much is uh, beneficial and something want to, I'd want to see. The size of the parliament, the headline size of the parliament at 129, I think right now is slightly larger than New Zealand's at 120 and in international terms is perhaps slightly smaller than the average but within the workable range. I don't think, even if we're getting rid of 59 politicians from Westminster that we're paying for, that people are, and the Constitutional Convention are going to be terribly desperate to sign up to another 30 uh, in, in Holyrood. That's for them to decide when the moment comes. The support mechanisms, the research mechanisms, right now we're funding a lot of that. Westminster, our share of the bill comes to us, we pay for it. Some of that might be useful to expand to help the opposition, whoever that might be. Again, that might be the SNP after 2016, who knows, to ensure that there's stronger uh, scrutiny in the parliament and that there's new uh, subject areas in particular of expertise for, for research support. But uh, broadly, I think that the parliament can manage it. And I think the parliament, unlike the UK government and the Westminster parliament, is actually looking at contingency planning at the moment for how it deals with that transition. Thanks, Marco. Um, shall we take some final comments or questions from Twitter and Charlotte? Um, sure. There isn't too much on that last point, just because I guess people haven't quite got their questions ready for it. But um, on currency unions and things people might want to be discussing on the discussion forum, um, why not create a Scottish currency um, totally independent? Uh, also, questions over, do we not already have some kind of currency union? Scottish sterling notes and coins are different from those used in the rest of the UK. And then uh, on the issue of the NHS, um, would privatisation open the NHS up to uh, global competition? And will that expose Scottish NHS too? Um, and in that transition period, would changes to the NHS down in the UK affect the Scottish NHS before independence actually happens in 2016? Great, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, Nicholas just spotted one final question that's come on Twitter that might be quite interesting to ask before we finish. It's just talking about um, uh, someone, someone by the name of Frightened Rad <laughs> has talked about um, the need for local governance and decentralisation perhaps not quite fitting in with some of the cent centralisation or, or nationwide organisation of services like the free service that, that we've seen. And I was just thinking that um, in the context of independence, as the, the, the powers, the responsibilities of the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament expand to new areas, does it then become um, easier perhaps to decentralise in some of the more service orientated uh, fields? I think the changes that we need in decentralisation are a long constitutional process and if I can be slightly free thinking, I would think that the last three years we've had enough in the political debate in Scotland constitutionally with independence for that to be explored quite as fully as it might have been. And I would think that would be something that would be a major focus for discussion in the first term of an independent parliament. And 
the the commenter on Twitter referred specifically to the Scottish police force. You know, before when we had eight police forces, they were managed by boards of councillors that nobody knew the name of. Now every one of the thirty-two councils has their own scrutiny committee, and yes, there is one police force, but there is even more local accountability than there was before. So it, it's one of these things where the debate has become quite polarised and framed in the terms of nationalisation versus centralisation. Our colleagues in the Yes movement, the Green Party, are always the ones to call for us to decentralise powers. When we uh, published that uh, individual councils should have the authority to decide on uh, fracking applications, they, they were all for no, no, national ban. When I say it's up to local authorities to decide whether they're going to spend 10% of their transport budget on cycling, the Greens are all, no, everybody should spend 10% of their na of their transport budget on cycling. So, you know, we could characterise this either way. I think there's a lot of decentralisation that this government has done. Some things move up, some things move down. That always happens in government. But I think after independence, we will have that opportunity to think, right, well, which is the level that should decide X and which is the level that should decide Y? Because, as I said, we're starting, in a way, constitutionally from scratch. Thank you very much, Marco. That's an interesting uh, thought to end on. Um, it just remains for me to thank our panel of Nicola McEwen, um, Charlie Jeffrey, and Marco Biaggi for coming along today to share his thoughts with us. Our next online seminar is at the same time next week, and we'll be discussing the case for no with Kezia Dugdale, MSP, and we hope you can join us then. Goodbye.